fear, anxiety, and loneliness. And then Corona came along. The added isolation for those with dementia is damaging. So is forgetting to follow the new rules, to avoid getting or transmitting the virus. It's also a challenge and danger for caregivers. There's more evidence showing a person with dementia in a care home is actually at higher risk of catching COVID-19. The risk of severe symptoms rises steeply with age. Nine in 10 deaths have been people over 60. So how do you go about isolating someone who, for whom isolation is the worst thing possible? and explain to them what the coronavirus is and how to respond when they keep forgetting. We'll talk to a dementia nurse about that in a moment. First, this report on how a family's coping with the same situation in India. Quarantine has been fun for Prabhavati Surti. She has spent it playing games, attending online classes and colouring with her nine-year-old granddaughter, Shubhi. And these activities have taken on an added purpose in managing Prabhavati's Alzheimer's. Living with the disease for nine years has led to memory loss and limited her speech. But engaging with her granddaughter serves as crucial cognitive therapy. Shubhi has grown up understanding her grandmother is different. When she was younger, she was at times frustrated that she was the one looking after Prabhavati instead of the other way around. Now, she talks excitedly about the fun games she dreams up for her grandmother. Making lemonade together, giving her a spa experience. Her mother proudly calls her Prabhavati's primary caregiver. She keeps giving me comments and compliments. And it's really nice to hear from your grandma after a long time. So it's actually pretty good. I think she's fighting the disease and she's trying to get hold of herself and uh, trying to talk to me. She's trying to converse during uh, this lockdown. But Prabhavati, surrounded by loving family, has been one of the more fortunate patients. Daycare centres like this one, called Hope Ek Asha, were instrumental in providing patient care before the pandemic. Doctors say socialisation helps immensely in managing the disease. But now, things look different. Group sessions are no longer held and all the caregivers wear protective gear and maintain social distance. The change was confusing and isolating for residential patients. They were used to uh, the caregivers sitting next to them, hugging them, you know, giving them comfort. They were per perplexed. What is this? and they were always uh, calling them, come here, come here. While the residents adjust to their new circumstances, the NGO is also helping patients at home. They have developed a schedule and activity kits with cognitive exercises, which they then help the patients tackle through video calls. Keeping patients engaged helps avert episodes of violence, which can be aggravated by isolation. Patients had become very aggressive in the first three, two, three months, two, and there was total lockdown. Uh, they were not even taken out into the park or even outside. At that time, they had become very aggressive. But uh, after following this routine, the routine we gave them, uh, there's a lot of difference. Now they are not aggressive. The Surtis have managed to keep any such episodes in check. Shubhi misses her friends at school, but is enjoying the praise and affection she gets for looking after her grandmother. She's certain Prabhavati quietly enjoys it too. Victoria Lyons is an admiral nurse. She works with the families of dementia patients and their carers. Uh, how do you isolate sufferers without worsening their condition? Hello. Um, it's, it's actually incredibly difficult to, to do, really, because, of course, the person with dementia might not understand um, what you're asking them to do and the rationale behind it, um, or even understand the language that you're using. So some of the, the advice that we give to people is to think about how you explain the virus and explain what's, what's going on. And, you know, rather than using words like 
pandemic or COVID that don't necessarily make sense using um, simpler words, you know, talking about things like flu-like illnesses and, you know, mm-hmm. trying to make it really straightforward for people that they, they, they understand that there's something out there that's harmful and that's, that's you know, risky to them and, and that they need to stay um, isolated and, and on their own a little bit. And then one of the other things that um, I think it's always really important when, when you're supporting someone with dementia is to think about engaging them in meaningful activities um, because then you can kind of distract them in a way from some of the, the mm. worry. And when I, when I talk about meaningful activities, I, I mean activities that are meaningful for the person themselves. So maybe music that they like or food that they like or some activities or past hobbies that they may have held in, in the past. So, you know, you, you kind of talk about the reason why you have to do what you have to do and that you have to isolate because there is this, this there's some germs and disease that's harmful to us. But then try to create a safe space for the person to engage in something that's, that's meaningful in their own home or, or in a care facility, wherever they may be. And, and what difference can relatives make by, by getting involved? Relatives will make a huge difference. And for the majority of people with dementia will be living in their own home, um, so they'll be cared for predominantly by their relative. And certainly in the UK, um, as a result of COVID, you know, we've seen a reduction in the kind of social care that's available and the visits that might happen um, because, of course, carers have got sick and they've gone off themselves for professional carers. So, so families are having to, in some cases, take on much more of the day-to-day caring than, than they may have done. Um, and, you know, so that, that does have an impact. And, and for relatives... Um, you know, you, you might kind of think about if you're living in your ha- own house with somebody with dementia, you might kind of decide to make our day bearable or passable or, you know, mm. to get through the day and to kind of zone different parts of the room. So, um, you know, maybe go to a, di- like, um, watch a film in the living room, listen to the radio in the kitchen, do some puzzles at a table, um, take a walk in the garden, you know, so you kind of zone different things um, and on almost timetable different things that you can do throughout the day um, to kind of put some structure in place, um, you, you know, as you go through your day, really. What, what about when it comes to care centres? Because some of them have been coronavirus incubators. Yeah, absolutely. And certainly in the, in the UK, a lot of the um, the kind of daycare centres and services, obviously, they, they closed, they, they stopped. And and um, that, that's something that hasn't happened. You know, people haven't been at risk there because they've not gone to these places. Um, but there's there's always a risk with this because it's, it's kind of a balance, isn't it? You know, if, if you, you close the centre to prevent people from getting um, contaminated in each other and, you know, picking up viruses. But actually then you, you face an increased risk if people are socially isolated, then they've not got the stimulation that they need, the carers, the families haven't got the break, um, that they might desperately need to, um, you know, enable them to, to kind of stock up on their own reserves and, and do what they need to do. So it is, it is a risk with some of the kind of daycare sure. centres. Um, you know, yes, there's a risk people might go there and, and catch COVID, but there's a massive risk um, and, and if they don't go there as well because they, they, you know, they, they also risk declining and their abilities will, will get, you know, will reduce as they spend more time in home on their own. OK, Victoria, um, we'll, we'll, we'll have to leave it there. Sorry, we're running out of time. It was okay. fantastic having you on the show. Thank Lovely. you very much. Thank you for asking us. Take care. Bye. And time to look at your questions about the coronavirus. Here's our science guy, Derek Williams. I'm more confused than ever. Is the virus less deadly than we once thought, but more contagious? These are actually uh, two separate questions, so I'm going to split them up. Um, On whether SARS-CoV-2 is less deadly than we once thought, Uh, I'd say yes. Uh, Remembering back to the early days of the outbreak, I recall estimates saying COVID-19 might kill up to 5% of the people who contracted it or or, or even more. Um, Since then, testing programs have ramped up and we're detecting many more asymptomatic or or mild cases. Um, We've also gotten a lot better at treating people who develop severe forms of the disease. So although, of course, the overall death toll continues to rise as as huge numbers of people are now infected every day, um, the percentage of those infections that end in death is actually much smaller than we once thought. Um, Most experts now believe 
that if a thousand people catch COVID-19, it will kill somewhere between five and 10 of them, which is, is still pretty deadly, much more so than, than currently circulating strains of flu. Second question, um, is it more or less contagious than we once thought? Well, contagiousness, unfortunately, can't um, be pinned down with any real accuracy because it isn't a fixed quantity. Um, it's affected by, by a range of factors, not just involving what the virus does in our bodies, but, but also what we do to try to prevent the virus from getting into our bodies. Um, factors like social distancing or, or wearing masks. Um, rising herd immunity also affects the metrics we use to judge things like this. But, but in most places, that's still far from making uh, much of a difference. Um, the most you can really say, I think, is that when trying to compare SARS-CoV-2's transmissibility at the start of the pandemic uh, to what we've learned over time, it might look like it goes up or down. But exactly how much those changes are due to the virus's innate contagiousness and how much is due to other factors like pandemic response, um, nobody I read could provide that answer. And a quick look at the latest data from over 200 countries shows new cases have doubled in 23 nations and increased in another 80 countries. They've stayed at the same level in nine countries. 72 nations have seen their new positive COVID-19 cases fall somewhat another 17 halving, and eight countries have reported no new cases for four weeks in a row. Here's the bar graph stacked up against the statistics of the last weeks. The battle is won when that whole chart is blue. There's a way to go.